So, welcome to Tales Tomorrow. I am Mario, your storyteller for today, and I am back with more Ballad of Iris stories. Yes, it is finally coming to a, a grand conclusion to find out more about the sadistic, horny DM that is Iris. Also, apologies for not making videos for a couple of days. The weather has been going kind of crazy, it's been giving me a massive headache. It's been actually really bad. Either that or Iris stories actually gave me a headache for once. Jokes aside, we have our conclusive story from the original OP of Iris stories, Blue Viera. We're gonna find out some Iris Iris lore, which typically I'll be kind of happy, but knowing Iris, it's not exactly the most happiest thing out there. Anyway, let's get to the story. The Ballad of Iris, Iris Herself. Hey there, fellow horror story enthusiast. It has finally come time for the final horror story I'll be posting about my group's former DM, who we will call Iris. While I have enough stories to probably make an additional few posts, I think I've tortured you enough. In these stories, I'll refer to everyone involved besides Iris by the class that played in the first campaign I joined the group for. Today's topic will cover how we tried to deal with Iris, how the group finally jumped ship and took the oars with us, and how we're doing now. But first, I think it's finally time to reveal why we call Iris Iris. Thank you for reading. The All-Seeing Iris so I think it's a pretty common thing for DMs to have recurring characters who appear either in multiple campaigns or even in every one of their campaigns. I have one of my own, my players haven't met yet, and I think we can all agree that as long as these characters don't become the main focus, as long as they stay in the background, or really be anything other than an oppressive in-your-face distraction, there isn't any real problem with having a recurring character or two. Oh, that's fine. The only good DMPC is the one that don't take the spotlight. But anyway, sorry, I'm a little tangent. Let's get back to the story. Iris didn't have one or two, Iris had many. The evil counsel from the prequel campaign I mentioned, recurring characters. Melissa especially is apparently one of Iris' favorite ones who's quite often a criminal genius the party cannot defeat. Nelby and her council of undead children from the fairy tale campaign, wow, they're also recurring villains who you probably cannot defeat. Iris' favorite artifice is super genius, the players cannot even defeat because they have infinite simulacrums, recurring character. Funny side note, Iris said no matter what, this guy was a the most handsome character. Also while we couldn't defeat him, his stolen player characters turned NPC could in a cutscene. So these characters and a few others I think prove Iris kinda had a thing for making every recurring character be a smarter than the player villain. However, there is one recurring character who stands far and above the rest of them. I'd like to introduce the omniscient, the omnipresent, the omnipotent, the omni pain in your ass goddess of mimetic evil, Iris. Yes, Iris put themselves in a the game as a fourth wall breaking goddess of evil who showed up everywhere, was responsible for literally everything, and was my actual eye in the game. Yeah, the flags are as crimson as Iris' eyes is. I kind of imagine Iris having purple eyes or pink eyes, but yeah, you know, red actually kind of makes sense totally. The giant floating eyeball evil god was our DM with all their meta knowledge. To differentiate the real person and the goddess, I'll continue to call our former DM Iris, and let's call the evil god Pink Eye. Pink Eye had meta knowledge from every game Iris had ever. <laughs> Sorry, it's just Pink Eye. <laughs> you don't call somebody Pink Eye because you want to give them like any sort of respect or any sort of like differentiation. It's just Pink Eye because it's just pain in the ass. It's painful. And it's annoying to deal with. <laughs> I like that. Pink Eye had meta knowledge from every game Iris had ever put her in, which is apparently all of them. If a player outsmarted her in one way in a past campaign, even a past group, then Pink Eye in future campaign could not be outsmarted the same way again, because they had all the DM's knowledge. No matter what patron you chose, if you took Warlock in game, Pink Eye was your secret patron. Warlocks were basically accidental clerics of Pink Eye. In the Sky City campaign before I joined the group, there were two Warlock multi-classes and they took different patrons, only to find out the patrons were both somehow Pink Eye, despite being voiced differently. Remember the goddess of evil who made multiple deals with the party in a prequel campaign before turning a player character into an infinitely powerful NPC boss? Yeah, that was Pink Eye. Remember Scarlet Grandma, who was secretly for some reason responsible for every bad thing that had ever happened to the party, ever, made them sign a magic contract saying they would never try to harm her? Yeah, that was Pink Eye. Iris revealed after canceling the campaign that Pink Eye had trapped Nelby in her straw as hell and turned her into a villain and then made all of us come there to screw with Nelby even more. 
<laughs> my orphan raised by wolves? Yeah, she was a homunculus made by Pink Eye, so that Iris could give their self-insert god even more control over our backgrounds. Huh. I called it. Iris is a control freak. And they literally put their goddess, Pink Eye, everywhere just so they can have full control over what's going on. Justification for, oh, why things are happening. Oh, because my god secretly is the one that's taking over everything. I've been, my god's been playing 4D chess the whole time and knows all the meta knowledge. Okay, listen, I gotta be honest. Characters that know meta knowledge within a DD campaign within any campaign in general right somebody that is has access to meta knowledge it's too much it's too much and it's just like it's so much for players to keep up with it's so much for you as a dm to keep up with but i mean i guess iris has to have that brought in because that's the only way they can have any sort of control but i feel bad for the players because they have to digest all this stuff like oh my god this person has meta knowledge from this like seventeen thousand different universes and now players have to deal with this god being thing that has knowledge from these all seventeen thousand different universes universes that can be used against them and the only reason this is even happening at all the only reason pink eye has all this meta knowledge is so they can get better control of the entire story the plot everything so that iris and pink eye can basically control the entire plot in one campaign, Iris even forced Rogue to play Pink Eye's demigod daughter, and then just had to basically be a trauma fest of Pink Eye, tortured Rogue in her dreams every birthday. It's a good thing we never had a campaign action make it all the way to the end, because it turns out Pink Eye was responsible for every villain and all the chaos in every campaign, and was apparently the actual secret final boss of multiple campaigns. This was spoiled to us, by the way. We all know about the fight is that Pink Eye was stronger than Nelby, who was stronger than the CF40 vampire Mobby, etc. So I'm pretty sure the fight would have been unwinnable. Iris told us Pink Eye was so strong that there were no other evil gods in any of the campaigns because Pink Eye was above all of them, leaps and bounds. Wow, you got his bestest ever. You know, if you character is the bestest ever and the most powerful ever and there's nothing that can be like ahead of them then you kind of just give away the whole excitement because like at the end of the day instead of introducing something new or something exciting or mysterious hey something mysterious to the campaign the players don't even have to be like oh, who could be the bad guy this time it's because at the end of the day it's like yeah of course it's got to be pink eye because iris because iris wants to have pink eye be literally everywhere just ham fist in every single scenario every single story every single ending every single time and then it's like oh, well, let's play another campaign. Who's the bad guy again? Pink Eye? Fuck. In the longest lasting campaign, Iris told us that if Pink Eye ever died in any campaign, she would die in every campaign as she was a meta existence. When the party started to actually talk about hunting Pink Eye down at max level and killing her, suddenly Iris changed their mind and said Pink Eye cannot be killed except one universe at a time, and she exists in every possible multiverse ever. What a fun and interesting enemy. We asked Iris many times to please stop reusing all these villains and especially Pink Eye. Iris' very telling response was, I will never stop using these characters in my games because using them over and over is how I have fun. I think it goes without saying that at this point, but Iris basically admitted that they hated when players beat one of the villains. We actually left soon after they said this. Completely off tangent, but like, I dislike the word metaverse. Especially when it comes to like, tech or crypto coin stuff or anything. Everything is a metaverse. Everything is a metaverse. Also, how convenient for Iris to just make it so that, oh, Pink Eye cannot die anymore after changing the rule. It, honestly, it'd probably be even more compelling if players had some sort of a drive to kill Pink Eye at some point or have some sort of a conclusion. That it just sounds really dope. I hate the concept of a character that basically is a same copy across multiple universes and stuff. But I mean, I like the idea that if you kill one on one universe, Universe, it dies in all the other universes. That way the players will have some sort of way to vent out the frustration of killing the BBEG. But no, Iris gotta be in control, Pink Eye gotta be in control, we can't have fun of Ian Iris games. We simply cannot have fun, because if it's not up to Iris, if Iris cannot have fun, nobody else can have fun. I wish I could do like a sassy, you know, you ever seen like people do the sassy like snap 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 kind of thing? I wish I could do that, but I, my fingers don't do that. The straws that break. So let's talk about why the group didn't recognize sooner everything wrong with Iris and leave immediately, as well as how we try to fix it and how it ended. What you need to know about Iris is that they feel so close to being an excellent DM. Iris puts a lot of detail into their characters, even if the world building is a bit off. Iris had a talent for making characters, villains, and settings feel very interesting in the moment. 
The Dark Fairy Tale campaign seemed amazing for the first couple of sessions until it was revealed that it was just Diet Curse of Strahd and Fairy Tale reference stopped. Cecil, the giant robot inventor, seemed like a compelling character until he showed up a dozen times in five sessions, and Iris revealed he couldn't be reasoned with but would leave us alone. And perhaps most importantly, Iris seemed like a friend until they didn't. Iris is a sad person. They'll present themselves in a confident and professional manner, but it was all a lie. Iris would draw you in and pretend to care about you, to want to know all your secrets and support you. But really, they just wanted to control us and to have ammunition to make fun of us. Even if they didn't realize it themselves, Iris wanted us to be at their beck and call. We weren't Iris's friends, we were Iris's audience and victims. That's how they get you. When it comes to any sort of fandoms, there are people out there that 90% of people in most communities are great. Actually, I would even say 97%, that's a very confident of me to say, 97% of people in any sort of fandom are wonderful. The other 3% are venomous snakes. And they know how to get in between of that 97% and to slither in, in these social things. Somebody actually in comments described it as Iris being a, a social vampire. And that's kind of actually, actually very on point. Iris is a social vampire and they sneak in, blend in, just so they can find themselves people to feed from and feed on their social energy and stuff and to be able to manipulate them, be able to uh, put them in difficult situations, be able to test out boundaries and limits and be able to basically just be a selfish prick. And that's basically what Iris was. Iris represented themselves as a confident person secretly filled with insecurities. I don't want to assume it was all on purpose, but Iris wheels up problems and gets out of jail free card. They're a master manipulator, and I don't believe any of it was unintentional. But I also don't think it was all intended to cause harm. Regardless of intention, it was bad. Iris would kick out any player who they saw as a threat, a person likely to call them out. They preyed on marginalized people while presenting themselves as one. Any man who joined the group, if Iris didn't consider them queer-coded and they had any degree of experience, then they were gone. Long-time player who weren't passive, gone. Basically, Iris sought out kind of passive people to surround themselves with and then held on with a vice grip. And that is the worst, trying to read people in such a way, looking specifically for the most easy to manipulate people out of everyone and weeding out the ones that would actually protest and sign up for others. That is, dude, that is fucking awful. That is genuinely fucking awful. Holy shit. Actual fucking vampire. I don't want to minimize the pain Iris caused, nor the fact that I firmly believe that they should not be in this hobby, but the anxiety they showed, the fear of being left alone, that much was real, and it tugged at our heartstrings. They painted themselves as a martyr and used that as a weapon to keep us close. There is no red flags more vibrantly crimson about Iris than the fact that they advertised themselves as an expert DM who had over a dozen years of experience and whose favorite part of TTRPGs is making friends and yet they don't have a single past player still willing to play with them. In fact, as far as I know, none even want to talk to them. But there's a reason the boiling frog metaphor is a thing. Oh my god, OP and I are on the same brainwave. I talked about the whole like boiling frog and water thing because that's what it felt like. We're on the same brainwave, OP. Yeah. Iris had major control issues, some of which stem from their past, and some which they're causing themselves by refusing to let go of their reign that have even tried to change just for a little bit. Towards the end, we saw Iris spiral and establish and quickly destroy a second group with a made of 5e campaign, where level 1 casters didn't have enough magic power to cast any spells. That group didn't even last two weeks. Iris had gotten so paranoid about players being able to break their unfair worlds that they considered literally everything power gaming and overpowered. For real, it's actually rather hilarious that Iris is threatened by a level 1 wizard. <laughs> Why? It's a level 1 wizard. A wizard has like minimum 6 health. Why are you threatened by it? Iris only listens temporarily to any criticism or boundary. They put on a facade of respectability and understanding, but they don't really care. A month or two after I joined the group, the party started giving gentle corrections to Iris. Sometimes they would adjust a bit, and it would seem like they listened, but always reverse to new players. Eventually this reached a head when Iris was on a call with Rogue and yelled at them. Iris really wanted to control Rogue, the youngest of us, most out of anyone, and when Rogue resisted about their Iris wanting to make their character a murderous true vampire, Iris blew up. And long story short, we tried to fix things, and I mediated the first of several observed calls between Iris and Rogue. If you need context for that, uh, link down description below for all the Iris videos, but the one you want to look at is the Rogue perspective. 
Before I explain on this, Iris asked me not to tell anyone about any of this, which was an hindsight for the attempt to control the group. Iris and Rogue had a conversation, where I helped them come to a conclusion that Iris shouldn't be alone in calls with Rogue anymore. We are trying to fix the friendship between the two of them, but we probably should have dropped Iris there in hindsight. From there, I began to regularly sit in on any call where Rogue and Iris were together, to try to talk Iris step by step through things and try to help Rogue clearly lay out their grievances. To be honest, there are probably hundreds of pages of material worth of things to write about here, but a long story short is we tried very hard to help Iris improve their behavior and to make friend groups stable. None of it worked and Iris eventually admitted they weren't even going to try anymore. I'd like to add now that all the help we tried to give Iris was largely prompted by Iris asking us to help them become better, but it wasn't really genuine. Iris would say things like, please help me, I don't know what is offensive, you have to tell me, I don't know what isn't hurtful, it's not my fault, my autism makes me not understand. Never mind that weaponized the autism when half the party was on a spectrum, we were manipulated to the very end. Iris' harassment of Rogue and Ranger reached a breaking point and Rogue left with Ranger leaving minutes after. Ranger had just been waiting for someone else to quit. At this point, Psychic, Barbarian, Fighter and myself were all about just done with Iris anyways. We had given them more than the benefit of the doubt, and more chances than any truly well-adjusted person would. Within minutes of Rogue's departure message, Iris cancelled all the long-term campaigns I'd been running because I can't bring myself to run the campaign she was in. I would think about her every time. The rest of us lasted one session longer. After Iris started a new campaign, we had the first session I realized I'm only here for the other players, so I asked Psychic if they wanted to leave. Psychic said yes. We asked Barbarian and Fighter. They said yes, with Fighter saying watching the dumpster fire had lost its charm, and just like that, Iris was gone. We all blocked them at the same time, after firing off a warning to the brand new players about what they were doing. And it was definitely the right choice. No D&D is better than bad D&D, and a bad friend isn't a friend at all. Thankfully. This didn't leave us with no D&D. Now this is something I'm super excited to read. This is the aftermath. This is everything after Iris has finally just been get, gotten rid of. I want to know what is going on with other players. I want to know if, who is sticking out, who is playing games and stuff. And I'm hoping y'all doing good regardless if you're playing D&D or not playing D&D. That's the one thing I'm hoping for. And I'm hoping there's no like a relapse of Iris slinking their vampire ways back in someone's uh, DMs and stuff. The after party. So the group may have left Iris, but none of us lost each other. My first campaign is still running over a year later, and the gang is all still here. And on top of this, Barbarian stepped up and took over DMing, the remnants of the traditional fantasy campaign Iris cancelled. And Barbarian? Yeah, he's an amazing DM. We've been having an absolute blast, and none of us have really had any problems with the group as far as I can tell. We started having Cards Against Humanity nights, movie nights, hang out all the time. To me. These people are family now. To be blunt, I love my group. We're just having an absolute blast. I even ran a spoof rhyming Grinch one-shot where the party had to deal with a beholder who had pink eye named Iris who was retconning all the characters' lives and even Santa out of existence. When the party got close to beating Iris, they retconned their minions' death several times before the minions got sick of it and started a union. They even ripped out the character sheets, killing an NPC and retconned a party member's trauma to try to make them less adventury. We are happy. Pretty much the moment we left Iris behind stress and disappeared. This gaming group? I think we're going the distance. Our first campaign is about to enter its final arc, and the players are achieving goals IRL. We support and love each other. Our ending with Iris wasn't particularly exciting or explosive, but it ended up so satisfying. Iris did their absolute best to keep us separated, and because of that, they brought us all together. Iris is the villain of the closed chapter of our story, and we will still have so many more pages to fill. Remember, if you see the red eye of Iris gazing down upon you, don't go towards the light. Thank you for reading, and thank you OP for posting. Seriously, this is the best outcome that possibly could happen. The fact, I mean, see, here's the thing, right? I didn't expect y'all to stick around for long. I mean, obviously everybody has their lives and stuff going on, but the fact that y'all still sticking out, going strong for a full year, and you're DMing, and Barbarian is DMing, ah, oh, my heart. Dude, this is 
Went from a horror story to an incredible glory story. A fair, a happy story, if anything. Maybe not a glory story, but definitely a very, very happy ending. My heart, as cold as it is, feels so warm right now. <laughs> you know what? I think this ending is the best we could possibly get. And you know what? It's hilarious also. It's absolutely funny how Iris could never finish their campaign. And yet, they actually were able to finish a story. The Iris, weirdly enough, this is a weird take, but Iris was in a way able to finally find a conclusion to the story, not to the D&D campaigns, but to a real life horror story. And the final conclusion is, Iris is gone. <laughs> it's ironic, isn't it? It's actually ironic. The biggest contribution to a greatest ending ever that Iris could do in any of the storytelling medium ever is just disappearing from these players' lives. Obviously, the credit goes to the players because they're the ones that blocked Iris and removed them out of their life. That's the biggest credit here. Thank you so much, OP, for your contribution, for the rogue to write their stuff. And I'm pretty sure we'll see little sprinkles here and there. Honestly, I think these stories are important because with so much stuff building up and so much frustration that people go through. Have you ever been in a moment where you had to go through something most frustrating, most difficult, and most annoying situations in life ever? And it just feels good to vent? That's basically what this is. Not only is it teaching people not not to be like Iris, because holy shit, Iris is a fucking disaster. I would think it'd be very liberating to vent about these sort of moments and just be able to put them out, out there into the void, like screaming into the void. Except me, I, I don't scream into the void. Mine screams back. And with that, that's gonna be all our stories for today. I want to thank you very much for watching and thanks so much for being here. If you like what I do, consider subscribing to the channel and leaving a like. Also, if the RPG horror stories ever goes down or if you want to submit your own personalized horror story, email is down in the description below. I'll see you again in more Tales tomorrow. Bye-bye.